Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming today is sponsored by Awake Us Now. We are a ministry with a heart to see awakening and revival in America. Thank you for joining us on our two-year study of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is an exciting series that will truly help open our hearts to Jesus, our Messiah. And now, here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. Father, we, uh, we praise you and honor your holy name. We, we thank you that you are our God, that, that you have always been involved in your creation, that you are near to us, and that you desire not only that we know about you, but that we know you. Lord, we pray that this evening we would be surprised and amazed as you come and encounter each of us. May, may Jesus speak to us in a mighty way here this, this night that every one of us may be amazed at your goodness, but also desire to know you even more. We pray, Lord, that you would direct our path this evening, that you would inform our minds, and above all else, Lord, change and renew our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, when last we left off, we had left off with Jesus encountering this Syrian woman who, uh, you know, is, is a, comes from a pagan root, one of the ancient enemies of Israel, living in a city that was notorious among the Jewish people of Jesus' day. Tyre was considered to be, uh, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, I think I may have mentioned this last time, it, it is the, uh, the, the city that best represents the enemies of the Jewish people in the first century. It's also a city that is rather notorious in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, because it's from Tyre and, and the region around Tyre and Sidon, that uh, the uh, daughter of Ethbaal, uh, the, the king of the Phoenicians, came. And she is the individual who was responsible for bringing Baal worship in all of its fullness into ancient Israel. Her name was Jezebel, uh, Ahab and Jezebel, king and queen. And uh, Jesus now goes into that territory to get away from the religious opposition. And isn't that an incredible thought? that Jesus has to escape the religious people by going to the pagans. And what unfolds now in this next chapter is just really remarkable because what we are going to see is Jesus first venturing into the non-Jewish world. He will not spend a lot of time there. In the, the New Testament, we have very little information about any time spent in, in Gentile areas. But it gives us a glimpse of what will ultimately come after his death and resurrection and after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's like uh, Mark is giving us a glimpse into the future of the way God is going to be moving. So I'd like to pick up in uh, chapter 7, verse 30, which is where we had left off last time. And uh, this is after Jesus has an encounter with with this uh, Syrian woman, uh, or Canaanite woman, you, you can call her. And uh, she goes at Jesus. Jesus treats her, in, at least in our feelings, uh, treats her rather shamefully. In reality, he treats her graciously. And uh, as I'd mentioned last week, she is the first person in the Gospel of Mark to hear one of Jesus' parables and understand it without being having it explained to her. And so we, we end in verse 30 with these words. It says, She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. You know, you can read that and say, well, isn't that nice, and then just move on. But I think we, we need to remember, these are real people. And, and these are not just simply religious stories. This is an eyewitness account that comes from Peter, written down by Mark, of real individuals. And this is the last we learn of this woman who had such a great encounter with Jesus and, and gave as well as she received. You, you could put it in those terms. And now she gets home and finds her daughter is delivered of demonic possession. You, you wonder what all has gone through her mind after Jesus tells her, basically, well said, you know, your, your daughter is healed. Uh, can't you just picture her running through the narrow streets uh, of Tyre, trying to get home, wanting to see if this is indeed the, the case, coming into the house and seeing her daughter there fully restored, 
Uh, what what must have gone through that mother's heart? I mean, did did she break into sobs at that particular point? Did she scream for joy? Did she do both? But also, what happened to her after that? You know, we're left hanging here, and and this is not uncommon in in the New Testament scriptures. They show glimpses of Jesus encountering people, delivering them, healing them, drawing them to himself, and then we never hear any more about them. What happened to this woman? We don't even know her name, but my guess is someday we're going to meet her because after this encounter, and and from what we know in the, the years that followed Jesus' ministry, death and resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the message of Jesus spread into this region like wildfire going across a, uh, a, a dried prairie. And uh, this lady, in all likelihood, was a follower of Jesus until the day of her death. Someday we'll get to talk to her and find out the rest of the story. And, you know, there are so many people in the scriptures that you'd love to know the rest of the story. For instance, what happened to Mary Magdalene? You know, the last time we see her is at the tomb of Jesus, and she meets the risen Lord. What happened to Lazarus? The last we see of him, he is raised from the dead, and then we find out that they are going to try to kill not only Jesus, but Lazarus as well. What happened to these people? Someday we will know. Right now, we can only speculate. What we do know is Jesus spends time up here in Tyre, and here is a non-Jewish pagan woman who believes more about Jesus than his family does, than the religious leaders do, and sadly seems to be a little sharper than even his disciples because she catches on. She's got it. With that, then, Mark continues the story of this, uh, basically, this missionary trip of Jesus in pagan territory. And what we're going to do then is we read in verse 31, it says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre, went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. Now, you can look at that as flyover country if you want, but if you do, you're going to miss a lot. We need to understand this is a real journey. Jesus leaves the land of Israel, and he heads up to Tyre in the north and to the west. From Tyre, he goes on to Sidon, and I apologize, this map does not have Sidon on it. Just to give you an idea, Sidon is another 20 miles along the coast north of Tyre. So Jesus goes Tyre and then 20 miles to the north, and from there, he wraps around and comes, Mark tells us, into the Decapolis. The Decapolis literally means 10 towns, Uh, Deca as in decade, 10 and then Paulus uh, cities. It's the, the region of the ten cities, and it incorporates basically much of modern-day Jordan, but also part of modern-day Syria. And in fact, the ten towns, I've got seven of them marked here. Um, the, the towns that we have marked here, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them real quickly. Uh, right over here is what is known as Scatopolis or Beth Shan. And Beth Shan today is the uh, most extensively excavated area in all of Israel, where they have dug up the the remains of an ancient Roman city and a series of other cities and buildings that go all the way back to the time of the, the Jewish kings and to the time of the warfare between Israel and ancient uh, peoples along the coast that, that we today memorialized by the name given to this area. Today it's called by many Palestine. Uh, That was not the original name. The original name was Israel, the land of Canaan. Uh, The name was changed to Palestine by the Romans when they defeated the Jewish people, scattered them, killed many of them, and scattered them throughout the empire. And then they renamed the territory after their greatest enemies, the Philistines. And that's where the name Palestine comes from. But uh, what we have here in Beth Shan are ruins that go all the way back to the time of Israel's uh, warfare with the Philistines. It was here that the body of King Saul was taken and hanged on the wall. And you can actually go to Beth Shan and go up on the tall 
and see the remains of a temple that dates back to the time of uh, the 10th, 11th century before Christ, you're probably seeing the very place where Saul's body was hung and where the, uh, the brave citizens of Jabesh Gilead came, took the bodies down and, and uh, removed them. Across the Jordan from Scatopolis or Beth Shan is a city known as Pella. And that has some real significance for the, the history of early Jewish believers in Jesus. You will recall that Jesus had predicted that the city of Jerusalem would ultimately be destroyed by the Romans. And, and he gave this prophecy and this warning uh, during the last week of his life. He told the believers, when you see the city surrounded by the armies, flee. And get away. Now, that is absolutely contrary to normal practice in the ancient world. When a city was surrounded by an enemy, uh, the best bet was to remain in the city because you could usually outlast a siege. A siege was tougher on the besieging army often than it was on the people within the town because they were prepared for it. But Jesus says, when you see the army surrounding, get out of there, go quickly, go immediately. And we actually have early Christian testimony that the believers in Jerusalem, when they saw the Roman armies approaching, left the city, went across the Jordan to this city right here, one of the, tw the ten towns, the city of Pella. It's not just a window. <laughs> anyway, that's where the early Jewish believers went, and they were preserved when... Somewhere approaching a million Jewish people died in the city of Jerusalem during the siege. Um, anyway, these are the, the towns of the Decapolis. It, they also include, uh, way off over here, the, uh, one of the oldest cities in the world, the city of Damascus. It's into that area now that Jesus comes. So he makes a journey, uh, basically a circuit of about 120 miles. Uh, this is no short little trip. But here's what Mark does. He gives us a glimpse of a few things that happened along the way. And that's what we're going to see now as we move into the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. And uh, so on that note, we read this. Then Jesus left the vicinity, verse 31, of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. Now, this is a, a, one of those sentences that you don't want to miss because there, there is so much going on here. I'm actually going to put it up on the screen. There are some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. The word that is translated could hardly talk, a single word in the Greek, mogalalus. It is a very unusual word. In fact, it only occurs one time in the entire New Testament, and that's right here. And it's describing an individual who was barely able to talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. Now, where is all this taking place? It's taking place up in the north, in the area around Tyre and Sidon. And uh, Mark intentionally uses a word that we see nowhere else in the Bible. And when that kind of thing happens, one of the things that we ought to say is, why would the Holy Spirit give Mark that word? What, what is it that would prompt this word to be placed here? Now, maybe, just maybe, uh, the Holy Spirit had no real reason at all and you know, just said, ah, write that down. If you believe that, we need to talk a little more. I mean, God does not do anything by accident. Uh, the, the Lord does not act capriciously. Instead, everything he does is done with intent, with brilliance, with purpose, and with power. And I believe that's exactly what we're seeing here. Because while this word is found nowhere else in the New Testament, there is one book of the Bible where it is found, and that is in the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. Mogalalus also appears there once, and it appears there once in a fascinating context, okay? It's Isaiah chapter 35. Now, if you think back to the, the, the writings of the prophet Isaiah, the, uh, the first 35 chapters of Isaiah 
include the opening prof prophecies of Isaiah. It includes his call to be a prophet by God. And it includes the, the uh, words that Isaiah was given from God, words of judgment on the city of Jerusalem, on the nation of Judah, and on the surrounding nations. But then you get to chapter 35. And before Isaiah talks about the attack by the Assyrians on the city of Jerusalem, God gives this incredible word of promise. Even though what you've seen so far looks really grim, God has a plan and he has a purpose. And the plan and the purpose is not only to restore the Jewish people, the chosen people, the, the uh, children of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but to reach the nations as well. And so in Isaiah chapter 35, and you might want to just turn there in your Bibles. I'm going to start at verse 1. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord. Now, where's Lebanon? Lebanon is the ancient area of Tyre and Sidon, ancient Phoenicia. And it says that God is going to do some great things even there. But then we get to the rest of the chapter, specifically Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. It says, Then the, will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute and it's the word mogalalis, the mute tongue shout for joy. That's the only other time that word is used. It's no accident. What the Lord is saying is the very things I promised to my servants, the prophets. Isaiah lived 700 years before the time of Jesus. What it's saying is the very things I promised through Isaiah are now coming to fulfillment in front of your very eyes. And what he does in this next section is he shows us the mute tongue shouting for joy, the eyes of the blind being opened, the ears of the deaf being unstopped, and it all unfolds right before us. It is no accident. It is the Lord's way of saying, see, I told you. You know, it, it's right there. Now, keep in mind, Mark is writing to a non-Jewish audience. He does not quote the Hebrew scriptures as often as the other evangelists do. But he still gets them in there. And this is just one of those very special ways that he makes it clear. And, and as you mine God's word, you see this and you say, oh, this, this is just incredible. Well, here's the way this event then unfolds in Gentile territory as Jesus for the first time in the gospel of Mark moves outside of Israel and uh, goes to non-Jewish people. This then is what we read. It says, uh, people brought him verse 32, a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. They begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. And you know, our reaction to that is, you know, uh, but, but Jesus is in non-Jewish territory. Among the Jewish people, however, saliva was considered to have healing properties. And uh, it was not uncommon. You know, as even we will lick a wound. Uh, in effect, Jesus is licking a wound here. And it says he touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly the very thing that the Father had predicted through the prophet Isaiah. The mute, the magalalas tongue shouts for joy. But there's more here than that. Literally translated, this phrase, his tongue was loosened. The, the Greek of the Gospel of Mark literally says, the chain of his tongue was broken. 
it, it's, it is a very picturesque phrase, and it's saying the chain that bound this man's tongue and made him unable to speak clearly, it is snapped because the Lord Jesus breaks chains, and he frees the prisoners. And what Isaiah had predicted is now being fulfilled in front of our very eyes. Again, it does not stop there. It says, verse 36, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more people kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. He is showing divine power and even their response. He has done everything well. Doesn't that kind of remind you of what we read in the opening chapters of Genesis? And God said, let there be, and there was, and God saw what he had made, and it was good. You know, everything Jesus touches is healed, is renewed. And uh, now he is in Gentile territory, and interestingly enough, what we see is he seems to be received better among the non-Jewish people than he was among the religious people. And uh, again, we're getting a glimpse of what is to come because God is going to fulfill everything. He said through the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and uh, Hosea and uh, Zechariah and Zephaniah and Habakkuk. He is going to do what he said, and that is even the nations are going to come to know the living God. At the time this is taking place, the nations are, are just overwhelmed with idolatry. But Jesus is breaking in and chain, changing all of that. He's breaking chains. Well, the story goes on into chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse along the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can, we get, can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. <laughs> I love that. How many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. I'm going to stop there for just a second. One of the unanswered questions here is, where does this take place? We just don't know. But it's somewhere in this circuit as Jesus goes from Sea of Galilee up to Tyre and Sidon and then around into the area of the ten towns. But there is no indicator here in Mark or in Matthew that would enable us to pinpoint the exact location. What we do know is this. This is apparently taking place in non-Jewish territory. Remember, Jesus had fed the 5,000 somewhere in the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. But now he is in non-Jewish territory, and he is going to feed a crowd again. We're told too, verse 2 of chapter 8, that Jesus had compassion. And the word that Mark uses is, a, is a, an especially expressive word. It, it talks about a deep level gut feeling for people. We have seen that elsewhere in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has compassion, uh, you know, a gut feeling for individuals. And it's not the people you would normally expect. He has you know, this deep emotional feeling here for Gentiles. On another occasion, uh, before feeding the 5,000, he had a deep, deep compassion for these individuals. And they turned out to be revolutionaries. They were ready to make him king and have him, you know, lead them in a battle against the Romans. He has compassion on the lepers here in the Gospel of Mark. And in chapter 9, we'll see him having compassion, this gut-level feeling for a boy who is demon-possessed and who has been under the, the influence of this demonic power all of his day, a, a, a demonic power that tries to throw him into the fire and destroy his life. Jesus has compassion for people that most devout religious folks would have turned their backs on. And again, it gives us great insight into the heart of our God. Our God cares for those who are desperate.
Our God cares for those who are on the outside looking in. The only individuals Jesus has trouble with are people who are religious and proud of it. And the only ones who do not hunger for him are those who don't think they have any problems. And here now he is again ministering to people who are in distress. These people have followed him for three days. Now think about that. He is in non-Jewish territory and the crowds are following him. And, and he has healed a man who was mute and unable to, to hear and says, now don't tell anyone, but they tell everyone and the crowds follow after him. And so now there's suddenly this group of 4,000 people. This will be the second miraculous feeding that we see here in the gospel of Mark. And uh, it's fascinating. The people who seem to have the most trouble with this account are religious people. Uh, because basically, most folks read this and they say, oh, he, he fed another group, large group of people with a small amount of food. That's really impressive. Many religious scholars in modern times have said, well, obviously, this is just another retelling of the same story. And, and whether the first feeding happened or not doesn't really matter. This is just a repetition of it. And it's probably trying to teach a spiritual lesson and so on and so forth. And you look at it and you say, it is very obvious. Mark is quoting an eyewitness, Peter, who was there and who is describing it in great detail. This is not just a nice little story that has some spiritual uh, overtones. This is what Jesus really did. And the difference between these stories is really quite significant. I mean, the similarity is he feeds a large group of people with a very small amount of food and there's a miraculous multiplication of food. But the details are remarkably different. In the one case, it's 5,000 men, not counting the women women and children. In this case, as we will see, it's 4,000 people. Now, some translations say 4,000 men, but, but the Greek that is used here literally means 4,000 individuals, male and female. Uh, it's a smaller group. Uh, different, different baskets are used to collect the pieces left over. We saw it in the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, Mark specifically describes, as do, I might add, Matthew and Luke and John. All four of the gospel authors say that the, the baskets Jesus used were what's called in Greek a kofinos, uh, from which we get coffin. You know, the specific kind of basket. Here, a different word is used, and it describes a, a basket that is made like a mat with handles on either side, and you put the material in the center and then gather it up like that. Uh, in the case of the uh, feeding of the 5,000, it's five loaves of bread and two fish. Here it's different. Listen to what we read. He told the crowd to sit down, verse 6. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. And uh, now the circuit is complete. Jesus has moved from the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee up into Lebanon, across the uh, area of the Golan Heights, down into the region that we today would call Jordan, and now he comes back to the Sea of Galilee and heads back over to the other side. This kind of gives you a picture uh, of where the, Jesus and the disciples would have sailed from. This is a photograph taken on the uh, southeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's looking to the west. And so over here would have been Gentile territory. I actually took this photo standing in the water. So, you know, you're, you're right in the water of the, the Sea of Galilee. You're looking over to the uh, western shore. Up here to the north would be uh, uh, Capernaum. And uh, Jesus is now coming back into Jewish territory. And it's fascinating the way it's described. It says, verse uh, 10, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. We don't know for sure where that is. 
Um, it is mentioned only here in the Gospel of Mark. It is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. There is very little documented evidence that we have from Jewish literature of the period. The best guess is Dalmanutha is on the uh, northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And if so, if it's where many scholars think it is, there's a picture of it. Uh, this is a photograph taken from the, uh, the northwestern shore looking to the south. And so this is the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Dalmanutha is believed to have been on this plain here. That's where Jesus goes. And uh, now he's back home. And it's same old, same old. <laughs> because he gets there and immediately, verse uh, 11, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. We pick up where we left off. You know, Jesus had left Israelite territory to go into pagan area because the Pharisees were making life miserable. And now he comes back and they're waiting for him. <laughs> you know, the, you, you can see how things are ramping up. And it says to test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply. Why does this generation ask for a sign? Uh, the, the word that's translated here, sighed deeply, is a word that is used only once in the New Testament, and it's right here. And, and in fact, it is such a rare word that when we search all of the ancient Greek manuscripts that we have, not just of the Bible, but anything written in Greek, the word that is translated sighed deeply is found less than 30 times in all of the thousands and thousands of documents that we have. This is an extremely rare word, and it is a word that appears to mean sigh with frustration and anger at the hardness of people's hearts. Why is it they cannot see? It immediately takes you back to the book of Exodus. Uh, specifically to Exodus 33. R remember when God had brought the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, he had delivered them through 10 plagues, brought them through the waters of the Red Sea, destroyed the army of Pharaoh, took them to Mount Sinai, fed them miraculously with manna, showed his presence at the top of Mount Sinai, gave them the law, the Ten Commandments, and then Moses goes back up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and what do they do? They make a golden calf, and they say, what happened to Moses? You know, we need to go back to Egypt. And Aaron says, here's your God who led you out of Egypt. And they bow down. They have an orgy is really the way it is described. Moses comes down from the mountain, breaks the tablets of stone, grinds up the golden calf, puts it in water, tells them, drink it and uh, then goes back up on the mountain to be with God and to plead for the, the children of Israel. And the Lord says he has every right to destroy them. He says, I'm not going to go with you, or I, I'm, I'm liable to destroy these folks. Their, their hearts are so hardened. And that really, that captures the, the anger, the frustration, the, the uh, just... You know, the deep sigh of Jesus, what more will it take? They're asking for a sign. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about that, and uh, specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He spoke about this very thing that is so much part of the, the nature of the people of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, Paul talks about this. He says, verse 22, Jews demand signs. And Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And now, what are they saying? They say, give us a sign from heaven. They're not asking for a miracle. 
They've already seen miracles. I mean, they have seen Jesus heal the, the, the blind, cure the lame, cast out demons, feed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, with five loaves of bread and two fish. They have seen him exercise authority over nature by stilling the storm. They, they've seen all these things, and they're still saying it's not enough. We need a sign from heaven. In other words, God's got to speak and tell us that you really are the genuine article. And Jesus says, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed over to the other side. It's like enough is enough. And he takes the disciples away. Now, we do not know how much time elapsed in the midst of all of this. You know, Mark does not give us uh, tremendous chronological clues. And in fact, if we had only Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we would assume that the ministry of Jesus with his disciples took place over a period of less than a year. Because we have the Gospel of John, we know it was longer. And John specifically mentions several Passovers. And as a result, uh, believers throughout the centuries have, have pretty much assumed that the ministry of Jesus must have lasted somewhere between two and three and a half years on, on the basis of what we have in John. Mark does not give us those chronological clues. So we don't know how much time has gone on. What we do know is we are coming to a, we're, we're coming basically to the continental divide of the gospel where Jesus has been working primarily among the Jewish people and has been healing the sick, casting out demons, demonstrating who he is. And, and we will now come to a point where, from this point on, everything will be focused on going to Jerusalem for the last time to carry out the mission that the Father has given him to do. We're coming to almost the midway point now, and it will be very significant, and we will see it in short order here. When this all took place, we believe probably a, a series of, of maybe uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 months before the, the final trip to Jerusalem and his death and resurrection. Can't say for sure. We do know now he backs away from Israel once again, goes over to the other side of the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and along the way on the boat, this is what transpires. Verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Now, Jesus has just fed the 4,000 He's just come back to, to Jewish territory. He's had this encounter with the Pharisees. And Jesus is talking to his disciples in the boat. He says, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. They still don't get it. You know, you, you just got to love this. I, I mean, it is human nature. It is what Jesus is dealing with. He's been showing them all along. You need to have your eyes open to see what God is doing. You need to understand how near the Father is. You need to understand we are at the fulfillment of the ages, everything the prophets have spoken. And Jesus warns them, now, guys, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees, and Herod Antipas. Now, what do those two groups have in common? Not much. I mean, the Pharisees, they, they were hyper-religious. They, they were proud and, and you know, boastful of their standing with God. Antipas, on the other hand, was a political animal. They did have one thing in common. They both resisted Jesus. <laughs> they, they both turn their backs on the gospel of God's grace. And Jesus is saying, watch out for that kind of yeast. Don't let that into your own life. I believe there are incredible lessons for us there. Uh, first of all, we tend to think that the real danger in the life of a believer is going the way of Herod Antipas, one who's simply living for things, living for stuff, living for power, living for material possessions. And certainly that is an obstacle to real faith. But another obstacle to real faith, and perhaps the most dangerous obstacle to real faith, is religion. 
being proud of your accomplishments, proud of what you've done, proud of how good you are, looking down on others. Jesus says, look out for that yeast because a little bit of it leavens the whole loaf. And he tells his disciples, watch out for that yeast. Yeast in the New Testament, when it's used in a a metaphorical way like this, is invariably, with one exception, it's used in a negative way. Jesus is using it here negative and saying, don't be like the, uh, the Pharisees who are proud and boastful of their religious accomplishments or like Herod Antipas, who is more concerned with his personal comfort than he is with the things of God. Don't let any of that yeast into your lives. And, and the disciples, they just don't get it. They say, you know, I bet he's talking about the fact that we didn't bring enough bread. Now, you know, the guy who can feed 4,000 people with seven loaves is going to be able to make a a nice size loaf in the boat work out. They, They still don't get it. And it leads us to the next incident that Mark speaks of. Aware of their discussion, verse 17, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? You know, that's the very thing the prophets had rebuked ancient Israel on. That if if they'd only have eyes to see and ears to hear, then I'd come and heal them. Jesus says, when I broke five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida, and some of the people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Now, what we have had here is the disciples are moving with Jesus from Galilee over to the northwestern shore by Bethsaida, an area not controlled by Herod Antipas. They're getting away from Jesus' main opponents. And Jesus is talking to them, watch out for the yeast of Antipas and of the Pharisees. And he's saying, don't let that corrupt you. Uh, When we get to the shore, we come over to the area around Bethsaida, And just north of Bethsaida is another town that Jesus ministered in. When we read the Gospels, we see that he spent a lot of time in a little triangle that goes from Capernaum to Bethsaida to Chorazin. And at Chorazin, one of the things that archaeologists have unearthed is a first century synagogue. It goes back to the time of Jesus. Now, in Capernaum, remember, we saw the the synagogue that is built on the the foundation of the synagogue of Jesus' day. But here at Chorazin, we've actually found the remains of a synagogue that goes back to the time of Jesus and the apostles. And one of the things that they found there is what's known as Moses' seat. It is a seat reserved for the, uh, the elite in the congregation. And Moses' seat was actually mentioned by Jesus in the very context that we have just seen as he warns about the yeast of the Pharisees. And so what I'd like to do is just pause for a moment as Jesus goes into this area again, takes his disciples out of Antipas' control. One of the things that Jesus does is he warns even more directly in the Gospel of Matthew about watching out for the Pharisees. And you can sense here the the increasing uh, tension and hostility between the Pharisees and Jesus. So if you'd hang on to um, Mark chapter 8 and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23, this is probably the most scathing words Jesus ever spoke. And he spoke them to religious people. Verse 2 of chapter 23 Jesus speaking, he says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. There's an example of it. It, We believe that every synagogue had one. So you must be very careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. 
In other words, the Pharisees and other prominent individuals would sit in Moses' seat and they would comment on the Torah, the writings of Moses, and they would instruct the congregation in it. Jesus is saying, listen to what they say because they're reading the scriptures in effect. But don't do what they do because these guys do not practice what they preach. And that is the yeast of the Pharisees that Jesus warns against. In Matthew 23, he talks very directly about what the Pharisees do. He says, verse 4, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. And and what that's referring to, the phylacteries are little boxes with leather straps attached to them. And in those boxes, they would place carefully handwritten words from from the book of Deuteronomy about following the Lord your God. And they would put one of those boxes on their forehead and then tie another box around their upper left arm closest to their heart. And uh, Jesus says they make sure they use the biggest boxes possible so that it stands out in public and everybody can tell they are really religious. Be the equivalent of having a great big cross on, on, around, hung around your neck. You know? And Jesus says not only that, but they, they make their tassels extra long. Those are the tzitzit that we talked about just recently. The uh, four tassels at, at the, the end of the prayer shawl. Jesus says they make their super long so that everybody can see them. He says they're all about show and nothing about truly living the life that God has called us to live. And with that, Jesus issues a series of woes. He says, verse 13, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you've succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. If anyone swears... You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound to that oath. You blind fools. And it goes on, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Seven woes. And what Jesus denounces here is religious pretension. It's, you know, claiming to be so holier than thou and not being humble before God, not caring about others, being so wrapped up in yourself that you forget the mercy and grace of God. Jesus will say, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You tithe mint, dill, and cumin from your garden, but you neglect the weightier things of mercy and justice. And you know, he says, you should have done the first without neglecting the rest. Jesus is saying, don't let that kind of yeast into your life. And, and for us, who are quote-unquote religious people, This is a powerful warning because the folks who most opposed Jesus are the religious. And if I may say so, the ones who opposed him most voraciously were also the clergy. (laughs) Uh, It's not comfortable to read that, but it's important to take it in. What the Lord is saying is be humble before me. You know, what does the Lord your God desire? He desires that you, what? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly before the Lord your God. And he's telling the disciples, don't let your hearts be hardened. And it's at that point now that we come to the most unique miracle in the New Testament. It is different than any other miracle we have recorded in all of the Gospels. And here it is. As Jesus is warning about this, And as the disciples are are ruminating on these things, we read this. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, there's the saliva again. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, 
Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Now, what is going on here? This is the only miracle of Jesus recorded in the New Testament that is done in stages. Why is that? You know, some people look at this and say, well, maybe Jesus was just worn out. And so, you know, he was only operating at 50% and he couldn't heal him right away. Uh, you know, Jesus does nothing, in, you know, halfway. He, he does nothing that, you know, is just sort of slipshod. Everything is done with purpose. He only does what the Father is doing. He only says what the Father is saying. Everything is done deliberately and with precision and purpose. What is the deliberate purpose here? I believe he is making a point to the disciples. You know, they've been with him all along. They have seen how the religious people have turned their backs on him. They, they have recognized the struggle that Jesus has had with the, the, the religious authorities. They've seen how the Gentiles have received the message and, and come to him in droves. And, and they still are not getting it. And Jesus says in the boat, are you still, are your hearts hardened? Do you still not have eyes to see and ears to hear? He's healed a deaf man. And now he heals a blind man. And how does he heal him? Step by step. I believe what he's teaching us is that being healed of blindness doesn't necessarily happen in an instant. And for the disciples, that's going to be really true. Because it's only step by step that they begin to truly see. And I don't believe it's an accident that what follows is the confession of Peter as to who Jesus is. Because now they're starting to see. Their hearts were hardened in the boat. They still didn't get it. But now as Jesus heals this man and as they see him fulfilling everything the prophets had spoken, the deaf hearing, you know, and the blind seeing, they're starting to get it. And now we come to the, what I will call the, the continental divide in this gospel. And here it is. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. If you look up on the screen, this map runs the right direction. Got the Sea of Galilee right here. Capernaum and Bethsaida, Capernaum where Jesus had his headquarters, Bethsaida where he heals this blind man. And now it says they leave that area and they go up to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. It's about 25 miles to the north. It is in non-Jewish territory. It is an incredibly pagan area. Caesarea Philippi is uh, a city dedicated to Augustus Caesar. It is a pagan town. In fact, at Caesarea Philippi, you can still see this ancient grotto dedicated to the uh, Greek god Pan. Pan was the god of shepherds and the great outdoors. Uh, it's from Pan that we get the English word panic. Because according to Greek mythology, Pan, who is depicted as half man, half goat, this is not good, you know, and, and keep in mind the, the ancient goat remains the symbol of demonic worship. The, the circumscribed pentagram, the upside down star with a circle around it that is the symbol of, of Satanism goes back to the whole notion of the goat. Uh, the Lord is the good shepherd. His sheep follow him. The goats don't. And, and Pan is the goat personified, a human being with, with a, the bottom half a goat. He is depicted in Greek mythology as a, a lusty goat and, and also a real trickster and prankster who loves to scare people.
In fact, that's where panic comes from. Because according to the, the ancient mythology, Pan used to love to hide out in the woods. And when people walked by, he'd make noises and scare them so that they'd leave in a panic. Well, Jesus goes up into an area dedicated to Pan at Caesarea Philippi. This grotto still exists today. It was dedicated to the worship of Pan. And, and to all things pagan, it is one of the, there is a stream that starts here and flows down and becomes one of the three tributaries of the Jordan River. Today, you can still see this area. You can still see the remains uh, of pagan worship, of altars, and uh, what we would call uh, uh, basically, you know, holy sites. Jesus goes into this area and he asks his disciples a question. And the question is very simple. Who do people say I am? He starts um, in an impersonal way. What are folks saying about me? Who do they say I am? And the response is, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. The disciples were very gracious. They didn't say what others were saying. Like the religious leaders who were saying, he is demon-possessed. And it's by the power of the devil that he's casting out, out demons. They didn't say, well, and your family says you're crazy. They simply say, well, some say, you know, John the Baptist come back from the grave, like Herod Antipas. Some say Elijah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus makes it personal. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? That is such an imp important transition. What about you? And what the Lord says to us is, what about you? Who do you say I am? Who is he? You know, who is this Jesus? Now, so far, only two different sources have claimed that Jesus is the Son of God or the Messiah. The one is the Father. This is my beloved Son. You know? And the other is the demons. <laughs> And now, suddenly, they start to get it. And you realize why this is such an important transition. Jesus goes up into pagan territory, and he then asks, Who do you say that I am? And this is Peter's reply. Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, we don't know exactly where this took place, but somewhere near this pagan site, Jesus gets away with his disciples. You can see the grotto there. I climbed up on the rocks and got up high and took picture looking down. Um, but Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And they say, you're the Messiah. You know, this, this is the first time that someone other than the Heavenly Father or demonic hordes acknowledge who Jesus really is. And it's telling us they're starting to get it. The blind eyes are being opened. The deaf ears are starting to hear. And it's so important that our eyes are open, that our ears hear, that, that we encounter Jesus for whom he really is. He's not just a great teacher. He is not just the Son of God. He is not just the Messiah. He's God come to earth. You know, he is everything the Father has predicted, everything the prophets have promised. He is here and God has broken in. And Jesus says, now don't tell anyone about it. And you have to ask the question, why does he swear them to silence? Because although their eyes are being opened, they still don't see it all. You know, human nature is we want to see great and marvelous things right now. And Jesus has yet to show them that there is a, cr a price, there is a cost, and there is a tough road that lies ahead. And so again, and this is where we're going to end tonight, Jesus instructs them. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Not that way, Lord. We want the glory road. 
And Jesus has shown him. Now, the road to glory goes through a cross. And uh, this really is the midpoint of this gospel. Jesus is now revealing them, revealing to them what lies ahead. And from this point on, everything is going to change. Up until now, we have seen Jesus healing people, performing miracles, casting out demons. We have seen him showing more and more his power. But from this point on, everything is going to be focused on heading toward Jerusalem to fulfill the plan the Father has, has, has had in effect all along. And Jesus is making it very clear. This is not an easy road that lies ahead, but it brings glory to the Father and life to all who believe. And he shows them that up north as they get away in pagan territory. And I do believe there may well be just an incredible, incredible truth here because Jesus takes them to an area where Pan is honored. Pan is the, the idol of shepherds. And he looks like a goat. But Jesus is the good shepherd. And he's going to lay down his life for the sheep. I believe there are things there that are really significant. I will mention one other thing. This uh, grotto had a nickname. It was called the Gates of Hell or the Gates of Hades. And if you read elsewhere in the Gospels, as, as Matthew and Luke record this incident, they tell us that Jesus, among other things, said the following. I tell you, as Peter makes the confession, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, I tell you, you're, you're Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It may well be that that was in the background. I think there's a lot here, you know, a lot more than you just notice on the surface, but that would have become more and more apparent to the disciples as they begin to internalize who he is and that we are up against demonic powers and that only the Son of God can beat the enemy. But he's going to do it through suffering and through the cross and through his resurrection. Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. We hope today's message was a blessing. If you are asking yourself, now what? We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.